Okay. All right. So uh, today we will talk randomization tests, and uh, and we just watched that video. And in case you got here late or you're watching online, whatever you didn't you didn't get to see the video, and I'm not allowed to show you the video uh, on YouTube. You know, it was just a MythBusters TV show. They we, they selected uh, 50 people to participate, and each participant was told to sit in a room uh, alone, and they were monitored for several minutes. Uh, and before they entered the room, some of the people see uh, carry uh, yawn in front of them, and other people do not. And then the MythBusters team were uh, monitoring them to just see who yawns and who does not yawn. Okay, so um, just uh, a reminder that the sample itself was not randomly selected. They they called out, you know, they made an ad for extras or whatever, and so we don't have a random sample, so we can't generalized to the, uh, the population unless we make some assumption that says the people that appeared in our sample is representative of the general population. And maybe, maybe that's a reasonable assumption, maybe not, right? Uh, on the other hand, the treatments were randomly assigned. The assignment process was systematic. Um, they said every third person was control, carry yawned at two out of the three people. Um, so that process of kind of systematically assigning who gets um, treatment versus the control uh, results in random assignment because the kind of the order of people who show up uh, is random, right? That's a kind of a random process in terms of uh, what order the, the people came. And so um, they didn't give these exact numbers, but, um, but I kind of just guessed based on the data that I had. And I'm pretty sure this is the only set of numbers that work out. They said there were a total of 50 people Two-thirds were in the treatment group, and one-third was in the control group. So kind of the closest I could get was 34 versus 16. That's like 68 versus um, 32%. And then they said 29% in the treatment group yawned versus four people in the control group yawned. Um, and that's you know 29% versus 25% over here, OK? I think there's I'm missing a, a digit here. but. Um, but anyway, uh, so we have 10 over 34, and then Mythbusters says, um, you know, there's like, it was because the sample size was so big, and uh, you know, uh, you know, they said there's little doubt. The narrator says there's little doubt. It does seem to be contagious or something, okay? And that, and you guys all kind of chuckled at that um, conclusion, uh, which indicates that you are probably skeptical. Um, anyway, here's our. our data arranged in a two-way table, 50 people total, um, 10 and 4 in the control group yawn for a total of 14 people, um, 10 out of 34, around 29%, 4 out of 16, 25% uh, for the control group. Okay, So this is um, the data that we have. Okay, And so rather than just take uh, Mythbusters at their word, um, being good statisticians, we will perform a hypothesis test, okay? And so if we uh, set up our test in the same way, we uh, would start off with the null hypothesis that yawning is not contagious versus the alternative hypothesis that yawning is contagious, okay? And so symbolically, I'll say Y is for yawning, S for being in the seed group, meaning they got the seed yawn, and C for being in the control group, meaning they did not, okay? And so under the null hypothesis, symbolically, we would write something like this, that the probability of yawning if you're in the seed group um, versus the probability of yawning if you're in the control group, that these probabilities are exactly the same so that the difference between them is zero. Okay? So this, would, this is a way, one way to express that yawning is not contagious, that the probability of yawning, whether you're in the seed group or the control group, that there's no difference between them so that the difference is zero. Okay? And on the other hand, if we want to say that yawning is contagious, meaning that receiving the seed yawn makes it more likely for the person to yawn, we would write something like this, that uh, probability of yawning given that you're in the seed group versus the probability of yawning given that you're in the control group, that difference is going to be greater than zero because we're expecting uh, a higher proportion in the seed group to yawn versus the control group to yawn. Okay, so we would, uh, the alternative would be that this difference is greater than zero. Is that okay for the setup of the uh, the hypotheses? 
Okay, and in our data, so I have little hats to indicate that these are our data. The probability of yawning in our C group was 10 out of 34 versus the probability of yawning in our control group is 4 out of 16. That difference is around uh, 4 percentage points. I think, it's a, I think I'm missing a digit, but 4.4 uh, percentage points I think is what it is. Okay, around 4 percentage points. And the question is, is this difference significantly different from 0? That's, that's what we want to know, okay? And so, um, um, you know, the way we do our hypothesis test is, you know, kind of explore what's possible under the null hypothesis, okay? And so what we are saying is that if the null hypothesis is true, then whether a person yawns or does not yawn is not related to whether the person got the seed yawn or was in the control group, that there's no relationship between um, seeing someone else yawn and whether the person yawns, okay? Um, and that the results that we have obtained in our data, you know, this difference of 10 over 34 versus 4 over 16, this difference of 4 percentage points, that that was just a result of the random assignment of treatments, okay? That um, just by random chance, some people who yawned ended up in the treatment group and some people who didn't yawn ended up in the control group, that it has nothing to do with the actual treatment itself, whether the person got a seed yawn or did not, okay? Um, or we, we can think of this is that these 14 people um, who yawned, we can think of it as, as it was their destiny to yawn, okay? That these 14 people these 14 out of the 50 people, they were going to yawn no matter what. Whether somebody yawned in front of their face or whether they were put in the control group, it didn't matter. These 14 people were going to yawn when we put them in that room, okay? It was, uh, we can say that they were destined to yawn, okay? And, and the fact that we got 29% in the treatment group and 25% in the control group, that was just a result of the random assignment of who, who goes into treatment and who goes into control, okay? That's what we're saying if the null hypothesis were true. If the null hypothesis were true, we can treat it this way. And so the question is, what's the probability of getting this difference of, you know, four percentage points just from random assignment, okay? So again, our p-value is the probability of observing our data or something more extreme if the null hypothesis were true. That's kind of the definition of the p-value. And so if the null hypothesis were true, we would expect that proportion of people who yawn to be the same for both treatment and control. We would expect a difference of zero. Okay, we observed a difference of around four percentage points. Okay, and so the question is, um, what is the probability that we get a difference of four percentage points if random assignment is the only source of variation? Okay, that's what we want to know. If, if random assignment is the only reason why some one group has people who yawn versus another group has fewer or more people who yawn, if that's the only source of variation, what's the probability of getting this difference of four percentage points or more? Okay, um, because because um, we're asking, we want to make sure that there's no actual relationship between uh, the treatment and the control. We're just saying, well, what? What could happen if random assignment was the only source? Okay. Um, before I go on with the randomization test itself, uh, I do want to talk a little bit. So in your intro stats class, you might have learned about the chi-squared test. And if not the chi-squared test, maybe the two-proportion z-test Okay, uh, for comparing proportions of categorical variables. Okay. Um, and both the chi-squared test and the two-proportion z-test are based on the central limit theorem, okay? It might not have been apparent, um, you know, with the chi-squared test, uh, it might not be clear that there's a central limit theorem as assumption, but there is a distributional assumption uh, about, um, you know, the, how these numbers are, are distributed. And so anytime you do a parametric test with distributional assumptions, you've got to check to make sure that those assumptions and those conditions are valid, okay? And so uh, for using a chi-squared test, uh, one of the conditions to make sure that your assumptions are valid is that the, um, that the cells, uh, all cells in the expected counts table 
is greater than 5. Okay, that's one of the, uh, the conditions. And what we can see is that if I set up my expected counts table, I have uh, a count of 4.48, which is smaller than 5. So, um, so I can't use the chi-squared test. Okay, so this is uh, not a recommended test. And, and um, I'll, in the notes, I'll, I'll update them to include a link to the Wikipedia article on the chi-squared test in case you've forgotten how the chi-squared test works, or maybe you never learned. Um, maybe you, uh, I think in my stats 10 class, we don't actually get to the chi-squared test in 10 weeks, right? So I guess those of you in AP stats, maybe you had it, but not stats 10. But anyway, um, the way, way these expected counts come out is um, we say, well, if, if they are independent, then the probability of being in the control group and being in the yawning group is just a product of these two probabilities. That's the rule of independence, right? A and B is equal to A times, probability of A times the probability of B. Um, and so that um, the expected count in this cell is going to be 50 times that probability, which will be 50 times the probability of being control, which is 16 over 50, and the probability of being in the outcome yawn group, 14 over 50, and you get 4.48, okay? And again, because that number is smaller than 5, you can't, you're not supposed to use a chi-square test. Um, so anyway, instead of the chi-square test, we're going to do a randomization test. And the randomization test has no uh, distributional assumptions. We don't assume anything about the central limit theorem or anything like that. It's what we would consider a non-parametric test. And there's only one assumption in the randomization test, and that is that there is exchangeability in the outcomes, okay? And so this concept of exchangeability, um, I need to uh, spend a few minutes to discuss here. Uh, the idea is that um, under the null hypothesis, uh, if exchangeability, uh, if we're going to assume exchangeability, it means that all possible permutations of the data are equally likely, okay? Um, or uh, another idea is that the, any permutation of the data is exchangeable with any other permutation of the data, okay? Uh, on a practical level, this means that exchangeability applies to experiments where random assignment was used, okay? So if we think about um, the Mythbusters yawning experiment, the, uh, the ass assignment of treatments um, is basically a result of the kind of the random order of our 50 participants, okay? And if we um, did uh, the experiment on another day, um, we, uh, those 50 participants might be shuffled in a different order, okay? And, um, and again, if we think that those 14, uh, 14 yawners were going to, uh, were destined to yawn anyway, then, um, then the order in which they, they appear in the line doesn't really matter, okay? So that any uh, random arrangement of these 50 people is equally valid as any other random arrangement of 50 people, okay? And so, um, so the outcomes of, you know, uh, again, the, the order of those 14 people who yawned out of the 50, those are, uh, that random kind of arrangement is equally uh, is exchangeable or equally valid as any other random exchange uh, random arrangement okay and so if we think about um, experiments where we do use random assignment of who gets which treatment um, this assumption of exchangeability is going to hold okay because under the null hypothesis we're basically assuming that the outcomes that we observe is inherent to the person and has nothing to do with the treatment and so if, uh, if there was just another random assignment of treatments that do not affect the outcomes, then, um, then every, uh, every arrangement of these uh, random, random treatments is, is valid, okay? Um, on the other hand, if you have an observational study, okay, then, um, then there is no random assignment, and the, uh, the outcomes, the variables, are, are not exchangeable, okay? Or you don't have exchangeability, okay? So if, if you're taking a look at someone's, you know, race or gender or, you know, whatever, the, you know, their outcome is, you cannot exchange 
someone's race or gender with someone else's race or gender in in the data set. Okay, whereas uh, you know under the the null hypothesis, um, the the assignment of the the treatments that that is exchangeable under the null hypothesis. Okay, so um, exchangeability applies only to uh, uh, experiments where random assignments been used. Okay, so um, I've written the code out in here, but I think it's better if I kind of write the code live and just kind of talk about how this randomization test actually works, okay? So the, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vector of my uh, results, okay? So I'm going to just create, um, let me clear out my vector over here, okay? So um, here I'm going to say, uh, let's repeat True, we had uh, 10 people who yawned, uh, and we had uh, 24 people who did not yawn in the uh, treatment group. I'm sorry, in the uh, yeah, in the treatment group, 10 and 24, and 4 and 12. False 24. Oh yeah, yeah, false 24. That's sorry. And then. Um, Four people and uh, twelve people. Okay, so this is going to be uh, my vector of kind of results of people who yawn versus who pe people who do not yawn. So if I write yawning, these are kind of my results. And what I'm going to do is just according to our data, um, the treatment group will be the um, the first thirty-four people in my um, in my data, and the control group will be the uh, remaining 16 people. Okay, so I'm going to say treatment and control, and so um, so I can ask what is the mean of treatment, and it tells me that you have 29% uh, here, and uh, and the mean of the control group is we have, oops, oh, 35 through 50, I don't know what I did, okay. Okay, uh, and the mean of the control group is 25%, okay? So I, so I just say the first 34 people go into treatment and the last 16 people go into the control group, okay? And so um, the mean of treatment is around 29%, the mean of the control group is around 25%. So we have a difference of around four percentage points between these two groups. Okay, And so um, here I'm going to say the observed difference between, um, between these two groups is going to be you know, mean of treatment minus uh, mean of control. Okay, And so uh, that observed difference um, is around four percentage points, 4.4 percentage points, okay? So this is the difference between, you know, the 29% versus the 25%. We have a difference of around four percentage points. And so the question is, um, what is the probability of getting this if random assignment is our only source of variation, right? Observed difference is around, you know, 0.44 p-value asks what is the probability of getting a difference of 0.044 if random assignment is the only source of variation. Okay, so. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just try, uh, and so for re reproducibility, I'm going to set the C to 1. And we're going to just say, under the null hypothesis, any arrangement of our 50 people is valid, right? So the, this assumption of exchangeability is true. And so I'm going to just create a vector called uh, randomized. And this will be, uh, we're going to take our vector of 50 people in yawning, OK? so because uh, yawning has a length length of uh, 50. OK, we got uh, 50 people in yawning. 
and I'm going to just sample that. So sample with, you know, uh, by default just takes this and shuffles it up, okay? Um, I have, I don't have replace this true or anything like that. I just have just sample yawning and this is going to take, um, so now we have a vector of 50, but the arrangement of basically the outcomes true and false is random now, okay? And so here I'm going to um, say, let's take from our randomized group, let's assign the first 34 people, and I'm going to just call this group A. All right, and then into group B, I will assign the remaining um, remaining 16 people. And so here, we know that who ends up in group A and who ends up in group B has nothing to do with anything other than the random shuffling that happened in sample. Okay, this is the only part that's responsible for who ends up in group A and who ends up in group B. It has nothing to do with the treatment or the control or what, what ends up with what. It's just who ends up in which group is just a result of the, the randomization process only, okay? And so I can calculate the mean of group A, and I can calculate the mean of group B, and we know that these proportions, the proportion of true in group A and the proportion of true in group B, again, is a result of just the random sampling process only, the random assignment. So I'll go ahead and I'll do this, okay? And so just from random assignment, in group A, I have about 23%, 23.5%, and in group B, I have 37.5%, okay? So uh, our difference here, the difference between proportions, I have a difference of around negative 14 percentage points, okay? Um, so group A is kind of our analog to the treatment, and group B is kind of our analog to the control group, except um, it's the analog of just pure random assignment only, okay? We didn't actually do anything different. We just said we're going to just mix up our 50 people, 34 go into group A, and 16 go into group B. Uh, there's nothing else that differentiates the two groups. And we're getting, um, just by random chance, there were 14% uh, 14 percentage, 14 of the people in group A. Um, there were... Uh, 14 percentage points fewer in group A than in group B, okay? And we observed a difference of uh, four percentage points, and so we want to know how often, again, our p-value is how often do we, can we get a difference of four percentage points or something more just from random assignment, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, basically build a sampling distribution of randomized differences, of, of differences between randomized groups, right? So I'm going to basically just do the, the same command here of randomizing and uh, assigning some to group A and some to group B and calculating the difference between their proportions. But I'm going to do this a whole bunch of times. So I'm going to just create a vector called differences um, and I'll say I'll just do this 5,000 times, okay? And I'm going to do a, a for loop for i in uh, 1 through 5,000. What I'm going to do each time is I'm going to do this exact same thing. I'm going to take our yawning vector and just shuffle it, okay? Rearrange 50 people so that um, some going uh, so that so that their ordering is mixed up, okay? And, uh, and we're going to just put the first 34 into group A and the remaining 16 into group B. And then I'm going to calculate the proportion of group A versus the proportion of group B, which is going to be mean of group A, because I can do that with a logical true-false vector, which is a nice thing that R does, right? And then um, and we're going to just store this into our differences vector here. Is this okay? What's happening? And so this is this is basically just a just a few lines of code, uh, and we're going to do a, a randomization test. So we're we're taking um, again we're taking our 
vector of 50 people and we're shuffling it up and we're gonna just stick some 34 into group A and the remaining 16 into group B okay who gets put where has nothing to do with anything other than the random random sample process here the random assignment okay and then we're gonna just calculate what's what proportion do we get for group A versus the proportion of group B and we're gonna calculate that difference and then uh, you know just for reproducibility I'll set the seat here okay again all of these notes are, are uh, in the, um, the lecture notes but I think by typing it out I can kind of explain what I'm doing okay so let's go ahead and just take a look at what kind of values we got in um, this vector of differences okay so I have uh, I did this 5,000 times okay and so just the summary of the different 5,000 things I have, you know, um, on one hand, I got a difference as low as, you know, uh, difference in proportions is as big as, you know, 50 percentage points one way and 41 percentage points the other way. The, uh, the mean difference is very close to zero, 0 0.0033, okay? So, um, that, and that's what we would expect, okay? On average, if, the, uh, if there's no association between um, between anything, it's just a random process of who gets put into group A and who gets put into group B, we're expecting that difference to be right around zero because it's just a random process. Um, what we notice that our, is our median difference is, you know, four percentage points, 4.044, which is equal to um, what our observed difference is, right? So if we said, you know, what was the difference that we observed between the treatment and the control group? It's exactly that, 0.044117, and that's the median difference, okay? Um, let me go ahead and make a histogram of our differences. Okay, and I don't know if you can see this. Is We have kind of two bars here, and we have a gap here, and then we have a bar here, and then a bar here, uh, you know, gap, and then a bar, gap, bar, gap, bar, and things like that. So it's not exactly smooth as it looks fairly symmetric, maybe a tiny bit skewed to the left, um, but um, but anyway, uh, let's let's take a look uh, even um, just just more. Um, how would I calculate? How would I estimate our p value? So the empirical p value is going to be basically, um, you know, what's the probability of getting the difference we observed or something more extreme, right? So the difference we observed was 4.4 percentage points. And so the question is, how often do we get a difference of 4.4 percentage points or something greater than that um, by random chance alone, okay? And so, well, Okay, so we did uh, 5,000 of these things, and, um, and we can just see, well, how often um, for our differences, how often were they greater than or equal to our observed difference? Okay, and so here I get a, you know, I get a logical vector, true or false, and I can just ask, well, what is the proportion of trues where the differences is greater than or equal to the observed difference? And it says um, 50%, okay, 0.504. Okay, so, so we get a difference uh, as great, greater than or equal to our observed difference over half the time. So this means that, um, you know, in Mythbusters, they said 29% is bigger than 25%. We're getting a difference of four percentage points, and that confirms the, uh, the idea that yawning is contagious. But it turns out that if we just mixed up our people and we just and we didn't even do a seed yawn and we just said you know 34 people of you go over here and 14 uh, 16 people go over here uh, and we just want to see who yawns we're gonna get a difference of four percentage points over half the time anyway okay so that's just gonna happen just by random chance whether we did the treatment or the control whether we gave them a seed yawn or not um, 
this would have happened by, by randomness anyway. If we just if we just did group A versus group B, no no actual um, treatments, no actual anything going on other than the random assignment, we would have gotten a difference of four percentage points over half the time anyway. So so observing this difference of four percentage points is not convincing to us. Okay, it's not it's not going to convince us that um, the reason why it was different was because one group got the CD on and the other group got the control because this kind of difference would have happened just from just from randomly throwing some into group A and group B um, with no other uh, with nothing else going on. Okay. Um, this is our empirical p-value. Why is it an empirical p-value, not like a theoretic p-value? Anybody? What what is this p-value based on? Our 5,000 randomizations, right? So if if I did another 5,000, if I changed my seed to say two, and I did another 5,000, uh, my p-value ends up being a little different. I get 0.512 rather than 0.504. Okay, and uh, you know, um, so you know, 5,000 is a lot. I could do 50,000, and it probably doesn't cost my computer anything. Um, it took like another you know split second there, and, and I get 0. 0.51044. Okay, so so I'm getting something around 50%, a little bit a little bit higher than 50%. But these are just uh, results of just different random trials. So this was this was with fifty thousand trials rather than five thousand, um, and so maybe this is slightly more accurate. But you know who knows? Okay. Um, the uh, so anyway, this is empirical. It's not based on any kind of theoretic stuff, right? Um, we don't want to use the uh, the normal distribution okay we don't want to use the chi-square distribution because that expected count is uh, lower than five and we can kind of see the problem right so this does look unimodal and symmetric but what's the issue is we have these gaps right it's not a continuous distribution using something like the normal distribution for proportions and things like that um, basically assumes that there's some kind of uh, continuous distribution, why are we observing these gaps? Like, why do I have a, a, a bar here, but I don't have a bar here, and I have a bar over here? Well, we didn't observe those values, but okay, but why, aren't, why am I not observing these values? Okay, let's, let's just kind of think, how did I get my observed difference? The observed difference I got was I said, well, what proportion uh, yawned versus those who didn't yawn, right? We had 10 out of 34 versus 4 out of 12, okay? And, um, and if I had changed this to be um, um, I'm not 4 out of 12, 4 out of 16, sorry, okay? Uh, if I change this so that there were only three people in the um, control group that yawned, then I would have to have 11 people over here, okay? And so over here I have a difference of four percentage points, and over here I have a difference of 13, you know, 13 percentage points, almost 14 percentage points, okay? I cannot put like 10 and a half and three and a half, okay? It's either gonna be 10 or it's gonna be 11, okay? There's no, there's no arrangement of our data that's gonna produce a value between four percentage points and 13 percentage points because I only have, I'm only allowed to have a whole number of people in each category, okay? And if I try going the other way, okay, and we say um, of the 14 people, nine end up in one group and five end up in the other group, you know, we get a difference of negative 0.0. Uh, four seven, and if uh, if I did eight versus six, okay, then we get a difference of negative uh, fourteen percentage points. Okay, so again, um, these are basically just the different arrangements that I'm allowed to have. I cannot have anything in between, so I'm not going to observe. I'm not going to observe a difference 
of seven percentage points or eight percentage points. It's just not possible with the data that I have. Okay, if we have 14 people who are going to yawn um, who are destined to yawn, they, there's no other way to arrange our data here. Okay, um, so that's why we see these gaps in here, and uh, and that would be that's one of the reasons why we would not want to use the chi-squared test or some kind of distributional test. Um, let's see. The um, so our empirical value. Here I did, uh, I only did mean greater than or equal to the observed value. What if I wanted to do a two-sided test? What, is, what does it mean to do have, have a two-sided test? So a two-sided test would be something like um, yawning affects, um, yawning affects yawning, right? We'll say a seed yawn Seed yawn affects yawning, so and that could be either positive or negative, right? So right now, because we're saying yawning is contagious, that having the seed yawn should have a positive difference than uh, being in the control group, meaning uh, it makes it more likely to yawn. But if we just said yawning, uh, the seed yawn affects yawn, either positive or negative, meaning that seeing somebody yawn could suddenly make you not want to yawn or something like that, then um, then we would be interested if any of the differences, the ab we would ask the absolute value of the differences, either the positive or the negative versions of these things are greater or than or equal to our observed difference. And when I calculate this, I get 1. What does that mean? That means 100% of my differences, at least the absolute values of these differences, are greater than or equal to our observed difference. So, um, you know, if, if we actually look at the differences, the um, oops, the absolute values. Uh, the smallest possible difference I can get is four point four percentage points. Okay, which is which is what we observed, right? And we kind of tried out these different ones, right? Any any other arrangement of the data will produce a larger difference than what we observed, okay? The smallest possible value is this difference of 4.4 percentage points. Uh, going the other way gives me a difference of 4.7 or 4.8 percentage points. Um, so there's just no arrangement of the data that's going to produce a difference smaller than 4 percentage points. So, you know, Mythbusters, they said, well, the difference isn't dramatic, right? 29 versus 25 percent, but given our sample size, uh, I would say it's confirmed, right? Well, it turns out, I'm sorry, Mythbusters, it's not possible to get an any smaller possible difference. You observed a difference of four percentage points. That's the theoretic absolute smallest possible difference you could observe between two two samples. And so, um, so then to then make some kind of conclusion that uh, yawning is contagious is 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 not good um, statistical reasoning there. Okay, but uh, but you know, MythBusters is a fun show. But just as far as the statistics goes, they didn't. They didn't consult anybody um, who uh, who could have advised them otherwise, right? Um, so anyway, um, that's uh, that's what we have for uh, the randomization test. Um, and then here, uh, um, there's something related, and this is called uh, called Fisher's exact test. Okay, so right now our p values are based on just you know, 5,000 randomization trials, right? So we just randomized our data. We said, well, how often could a random thing produce the, the value that we observed? And that's how we got our uh, kind of estimated empirical p-value. Well, even, um, so with 50 people, um, there's a lot of permutations, a lot of possible permutations of our people, but there's still just a finite number of ways you can arrange 50 people. Okay, and so Fisher's exact test actually would compute every single possible permutation of the data. Okay, it would say, well, if I have these 50 people, what is every single possible permutation of the data? You have like a bunch of factorials to calculate, and maybe some of them are too big for your calculator or computer to handle, but uh, Fisher's exact test does do um, the exact calculation of every single possible permutation and we'll give you an exact 
p-value for this situation. Okay, um, and so uh, so anyway, that's the randomization test. They're all kind of related. So you've got the randomization test, Fisher's exact test. Uh, there's just kind of a more generic term of permutation tests, which uh, would work. Which uh, randomization tests and Fisher's exact tests both kind of fall under. It's a uh, it's a little bit more. Uh, ambiguous, and these do not rely on any kind of distributional assumption, but just on the idea of rearranging our our data. Okay, that the uh, arrangement is exchangeable with any other uh, arrangement there. Okay, that uh, that's it for randomization tests. We'll uh, we'll end here for today, and uh, we'll see you guys uh, on Wednesday.